Hello friends, welcome to Diffusion Weekly. So a ton happened this week. In short, uh, we have QR codes that have been iterated twice with multiple uh, Diffusion models. There's a model that actually is able to take the reflection from someone's eye and turn that into a 3D nerf of the room they're in, which is kind of nuts. We actually have a open source, locally executable LLM that is nearly beating GPT 3.5 in coding performance and some information about how much has happened there. And finally, what I think is more of a topic in itself is a really wild progress update with uh, how a lot of companies, including Tesla and a number of others, are actually using generative AI text to video to actually train models that are building further models to drive and power self-driving vehicles. So I first saw this on Reddit and the first model that was released for this was a little wacky because you can tell it's really artistic, I'll put it that way. And it's interesting because you know, you'd, you would have thought that someone would have tried using a QR code as an input prompt or an input image for stable diffusion. And I guess this is the first time someone actually decided to put a model behind it. I think ghost clip is what's being used behind this. So starting here, you can tell that this model is pretty, we'll just say, you know, artistic in nature. So this is sort of a Japanese pagoda. We have you know, the, the squares here. This is sort of a more anime situation. Somehow AI stuff always seems to end up there. This is a nice uh, pattern of sorts that, that has kind of a texture that feels like marble, which is pretty cool. And all these scan, by the way. And what's crazy with these to me is that there's some where you can barely tell it's even a QR code and they still scan. And I've done some side projects with uh, that have actually been acquired that use QR codes in a, in a professional context. And it actually is wild how much research has gone into developing effectively AI that scans QR codes. So it's ironic that we're now coming at it from the other side of the equation. This one is really cool because I think the prompt here was some kind of circuit board or what it looks like if you look at a circuit board with an X-ray, which is actually used in industry quite a bit. So I thought this was cool because that's what jumped out in my head. The next one here, yeah, there's some, there are a lot of textile ones, which are sometimes cool, but they make these squares pretty obvious. And you can tell these get really abstract. Like this one, if someone didn't know what a QR code was, they probably would have thought it was some bizarre art or Japanese looking one. And there are some cu curious ones in the comments here as well. Um, like this obviously is just kind of a very exotic QR code. And I, I'm excited to see where this goes because I'll tell you that there are, there are only, there are almost like 40 different specs of QR codes that are officially supported. So they're like the ones you see on boarding passes, the ones that you see on um, inscribed on smaller devices. They can each cover and contain different amounts of information. So it's gonna be really cool to see what goes on. Now, uh, the next step of this control net fine tune was one that is, I would argue almost more artistic, but also is easier to use in advertising and to just identify generally. So this is a QR code of the Golden Gate Bridge. You can clearly see it's a bridge, it's a sunset, and I honestly like this fine tune better. I'm not really sure why, but it just feels more cohesive and a little bit easier on your eyes. Uh, some of these legitimately just hurt to look at. Um, this is one that uses New York as a background. There's some taxis down in the background, which is an interesting touch. And the guy that released this is uh, Dion Timmer. And I honestly really like his approach here because um, these are just, they're, they're just more usable. This, if I saw it in an ad, I'd be like, oh, that looks super cool. There's this interesting kind of trick here going on with uh, making this look kind of like an Aurora. It's airbrushed and these all still scan. And these actually scan more consistently with a number of devices uh, compared to the initial model that was used. Yeah, so then there's this cool Japanese one and I like these more. I, I think they're more practical. The implementation is clearly fine-tuned and tweaked a bit, but what I think is cool about this is it's kind of a fun way to overlap a number of cool applications of using this technology and again show uh, people who maybe aren't using this stuff every day how cool this technology really is. And as always, we'll link to the Hugging Face in the description below along with a short tutorial as to how to run this. If you make something cool, uh, put it in the comments below. Just don't link to anything that's ridiculous or you know not not great for YouTube. So the next paper or concept I want to cover is incredibly cool. Uh, it's obviously experimental and it's something that's a little weird and kind of uh, futuristic and dystopian in a way, but it's absolutely incredible and I think it starts to show some of the inference abilities and just things that we thought were just not even close to being possible that are now possible because 
of a lot of technology that has resulted from AI development. So this obviously uses AI, uh, uses NERFs, it uses a lot of complex optical uh, mathematics and understandings of how we look at reflection. And at a high level, what this showcases is um, kind of a paradigm shift in how we look at graphics and optics. So in the past with GPUs and then video games, just because they're an easier example, there was this idea that in order to get photorealism and to get realistic ref reflection and diffraction, things that make an image or a video game look super realistic, that you actually had to simulate as much of that as possible, that you had to simulate every photon of light uh, bouncing off something and then getting scattered by something, and you had to have perfect textures and perfect everything. And curiously enough, we realized that at some point there's a limit to how many polygons you can render in a single space, and there's a limitation just compute-wise as to how many particles and photons you can actually render per frame and get decent performance. A great example of this is how um, for the longest time before NVIDIA's um, AI-backed shaders had sort of been worked out, uh, it's why games like Cyberpunk 2077 were basically unplayable even on freakishly powerful hardware. And the paradigm shift that's happened is, in the industry of graphics at least, is there's been a shift to, as opposed to perfectly modeling smoke by physics or perfectly modeling reflection or diffraction or how water looks. Um, the idea now is build an AI model, get it as close as possible, compare it to physics in the real world, get it pretty close, and then iterate until you have something that looks kind of what you wanted in the first place. And this is a very cool example of stretching that about as far as we can go currently with what is publicly available. I'm sure DARPA has created uh, other freakishly powerful things that they don't really want to show us. So the idea of this is kind of interesting, uh, and this is what the abstract says. So uh, this says, the reflective nature of the human eye is an underappreciated source of information about what the world around us looks like. By imaging the eyes of a moving person, we can collect multiple views of a scene outside of the camera's direct line of sight, so like behind and around the entire camera, through the reflections in the eyes. In this paper, we reconstruct a 3D scene beyond the camera's line of sight using portrait images containing eye reflections. This task is challenging due to, one, the difficulty of accurately estimating eye poses, two, the entangled appearance of the eye iris and the scene reflection. Our method jointly refines cornea poses, the radiance field depicting the scene, and the observer's eyes iris texture. So they're using nerfs here, which we've covered before. We further propose a simple regularization prior on the iris texture pattern to improve reconstruction quality. Basically it worked. So the code hasn't been released yet, but looking at some of these a little bit closer in terms of the reconstructions, it's just totally nuts. Um, some of these are better than Luma AI scans of rooms that were just taken with iPhones and LiDAR. So the fact that this is being done without LiDAR is in my opinion, kind of nuts. And it's pretty good. Like what's nuts is to think about um, how the sensors used to take these images were not wildly experimental or even really the highest quality you can get or that you even need. So the fact that you don't have to have a perfect scan and that you can basically understand what's reflecting off of someone, uh, someone's eye with an infinitesimally small amount of information. So for instance, if you look at what they're starting with here, and then they're turning that into something like this. Mathematically crazy and also just kind of cool. And in a big way, a little bit creepy. So this is their rough approach. Basically they're saying we're, we have a really interesting way of looking at reflection coming off of the cornea and various different parts of the eyes. So that's kind of cool. Obviously this is probably only gonna work well in a pretty well lit room. Yeah, you know, that's I feel like that's fair to say. And a big part of their process or their innovation here is what they're calling eye pose optimization ablation, which is basically a really fancy way of saying, based on where the eye is, how is light being ablated or scattered within the eye? And uh, texture decomposition ablation, which is the same thing, but um, understanding how to reconstruct textures based on the, uh, the ablation of light going into the eyes again. And what's also really cool is they've tried doing this with images from the internet and it has sort of worked. I mean, obviously the, the fidelity is pretty low, so I wouldn't get too 
uh, creeped out by this for now, because uh, they pretty much say, um, using music videos from Miley Cyrus and Lady Gaga, we attempt to reconstruct what they're observing. We managed to reconstruct the object that appears in their eyes, resembling an upper body. However, due to the, to the quality of these videos, the correctness of the reconstruction is unclear. So hopefully this will get better in the, in the future. Yeah, and their code is coming soon. Obviously, this is just kind of an abstract for now, and it'll be very interesting to see a further presentation of how this is going. Moving on, there have been a lot of really interesting developments I've seen on Twitter in terms of fine tuning, tweaking, and pushing open source models to get really good at coding. Some of these have been tweaked to be really good at writing. And generally speaking, local LLMs are, they're good at a few specific things. And um, coding is one that obviously a lot of engineers have an interest in making so, Every day I probably see five to like 12 posts with people showing benchmarks of their trained models that get close to, you know, the, the gold standard, which is, you know, GPT-4 or GPT-3.5, only because they're not open source. So we don't know how they necessarily work. Google has made some shots of this. So there's, you know, AlphaCode, there's Palm, Palm Coder, and Microsoft also obviously has a few that they power GitHub Copilot with. We're just starting to now to see a lot of these bespoke models that are coming just from individual researchers, sometimes small groups, actually getting really close to uh, being about as good as GPT. 3.5. And this is multifaceted, right? Because this is primarily because we have better ways of benchmarking. So we can actually trust what people are saying a little bit more. There also are just people working on this in a much greater capacity. The model that we'll probably make a dedicated video on, which is called Wizard Coder, has been trained by someone to be basically a point away from being as good as GPT 3.5. So obviously we don't know the model size per se, but it's looking really, really good. And what's crazy is you can just download this uh, from Hugging Face, try it out in Hugging Face and see what happens. Now, what I will say is some of these vary because some of these are meant to be coding models you ask questions. Others are meant to be zero shot models that will just produce code that is working on the first try. And as someone who's used GPT-4 as a kind of a programming aid um, professionally, I can tell you sometimes it's really close and sometimes it's really not close and it's unsure of itself. And these LLMs you can run locally are getting freakishly good. Like some of these are actually faster and more responsive than GPT-4. And obviously the issue with GPT-4, even if you have a pro account, is you're limited to like 30 requests an hour, which is crazy. What's interesting is, you know, the, the feedback here really is that, um, and Anton, you should totally follow, by the way, he has very solid opinions. He's actually probably a better person to talk to about some of this stuff than I am. Yeah, so his thoughts were, um, this is the highest benchmark I've seen on human eval, which is one of the benchmarks at um, 15 billion parameters, which makes this model possible to run on your own machine using four or eight bit uh, weights, which is kind of cool. That basically means how much of the weights you can actually fit into memory um, at having a reasonably sized GPU. And the other comparison here is just percentage tests Pass. This is basically zero shot how many times the model created code that passed tests in a run of the mill test suite for software that's actually part of this evaluation suite. There, were, there have been a lot of technical papers that have actually looked at how good GPT-4 is at this stuff. It's kind of cool because the numbers shown here are the same as the technical report used in GPT-4. It could be that the models have improved or maybe the benchmark code is a bit different, but regardless, the numbers are impressive. Now, what's also cool with this is there are people who are already iterating on this. So for, um, Technium is another great person to follow if you like kind of the local LLM scene, especially for the coding stuff. Yeah, Wizard Coder is just super cool. Uh, they are a collective of engineers that have been working on this. And Wizard LM is also incredible. I use it locally and I doodle with it in my free time. And the final topic I wanna to get to, which is not really one post or one paper, but um, it's one of the more convincing steps in using generative AI to train autonomous vehicles that I've seen in some time. So for those of you who don't know, when self-driving cars are trained, especially at Tesla, the, the reason Tesla is so good at this is because they have cameras all over all their cars. And for the most part, uh, all the video those cars see and all the inputs they get from drivers and all the inputs they get from people who are testing um, FSD or full self-driving, all of that goes back to Tesla's huge supercomputer and is ingested on a daily basis, turned into huge data sets and improves their model every few hours actually. So the self-driving car space is really a competition of how much training data you have, how good it is, how good the inputs are, and then how like you know, what, what you actually do with that at scale to improve. Uh, and then of course the platform in the car is a, is a factor, but 
that's part of why this whole problem is so complex and difficult to solve, and also why Tesla is so far ahead in this game. So the idea here, right, is let's say with 60% confidence you could just generate video, and you could generate video at night, or when it's kind of dark, or when the streets are reflected from it raining, or if you have a sidewalk on the left and three crosswalks that come across in a weird angle. Um, what if you could do that? And then also, what if you could generate video at speed greater than 1x? So in theory, you could train a model to be more responsive, to ingest data faster, and also enhance focus on certain things. So say you wanted to train a bunch of video of a ton of you know, civilians and people everywhere and you didn't want the car to hit them. You could do that with generative AI as opposed to waiting for it to flow in with um, people. And the other thing is with actual vehicles collecting this data, you can only financially do that with so many cars, so it's why there are limitations with crews and zooks. And the other thing is people who are using this stuff, especially who are using FSD, um, that's a very limited number. It's only a couple thousand people in the US. And even if they're using it, they're gonna be really, really careful because obviously the people they're about to hit or that they're around, and all the drivers they're around, they're all real people. And if they screw up their Tesla, um, that's, that's an expensive mistake for someone trying to try out a cool experimental thing. And regardless of what you think about people um, trying out experimental AI on the roads around you, uh, I have yet to be rear-ended by a Tesla. I was actually almost hit by a cruise autonomous vehicle in San Francisco about two weeks ago. However, uh, it was kind of funny because then the car blocked the intersection for about three hours. And uh, I felt like, you know, for me, almost getting hit by a car that runs on AI. Um, of course, it was made by General Motors and um, the police eventually pushed it off to the side of the road. So all in all, you know, an okay experience. So this model is called Gaia One, produced by Wave AI. And what's curious is there are actually companies that are just focusing on generating this training data and then selling it to as many people as you know, just whoever wants it. But I think it's important to mention that there are a number of other companies doing this. Uh, NVIDIA notably has been doing this probably, I think since 2015. So, you know, not something that uh, is any one uh, paper, but I think this is a, one of the first like mass market uses for generative AI that actually is just blowing everything out of the water. So whoever gets this right and whoever can get some sort of government licensing behind it will be very wealthy because you know there are a lot of companies trying to break this problem and if you can provide accurate data for any number of locations and have it be detailed enough that they trust it won't ruin their model, um, there's immense, immense value there. So this is the last one for today. Uh, I will say I'm very, very excited about some very cool uh, GPU stuff I found on the internet yesterday. So um, stay tuned for our video covering AI rigs, specifically GPUs. We have some 5090 news. And uh, also kind of a last call, uh, if you're an AI developer or you do AI stuff and uh, you use a desktop with big GPUs attached to it, um, tweet us a picture of that um, at AI Flux. And uh, yeah, we'll put it in our video. And I think we might do that as a live stream. If you really don't want us to do it as a live stream and you made it this far, tell us in the comments. Uh, but yeah, as always, I hope you guys learned something. If you think we screwed something up or you want us to uh, do a correction or go into something in more detail, please let us know in the comments and we'll see you in the next one.